Frances Knorr's origins trace back to London, England, where she entered the world under the name Minnie Thwaites on December 10, 1868. In 1887, she embarked on a journey that led her to Sydney in the colony of New South Wales. Her father, William Sutton Thwaites, reportedly hailed from Chelsea and pursued the profession of a tailor. In the initial phases of her new life, Frances took on the role of a domestic servant. It was during this time that she entered into wedlock with Rudolf Knorr, a German immigrant. However, fate took an unexpected turn when she became entangled in an affair with Edward Thompson. This tumultuous affair prompted Frances to make a significant shift to Melbourne. Regrettably, the affair was short-lived and failed to flourish, leaving Frances Knorr with the task of securing her and her daughter's future independently. During the period of February 1892, Australia found itself in the grip of a severe economic depression, causing a scarcity of employment opportunities. In this challenging climate, Rudolf Knorr encountered legal trouble, being incarcerated for the sale of furniture acquired through higher purchase. Left pregnant and facing financial hardship, Frances confronted a dire situation. To navigate these dire straits, she took the initiative to establish herself as a childminder, engaging in what is colloquially known as baby farming. Throughout this period, she traversed the city of Melbourne, often utilizing both her maiden and married names. Tragically, Frances Nora resorted to distressing actions in cases where she couldn't find suitable placements for the babies or sell them to childless couples. Amidst her residence on Moreland Road within the Brunswick suburb of Melbourne, she committed heinous acts of strangling some of these infants. She proceeded to bury one victim in her garden and subsequently two more at her later abode on Davis Street. Upon assuming tenancy at the Moreland Road address, the new occupant stumbled upon the lifeless body of an infant girl while preparing a garden bed. The ensuing police investigation swiftly led to the doorstep of Nora, who had already relocated to Sydney with her husband. Authorities meticulously probed the matter, unearthing a series of grim discoveries by excavating gardens across various Melbourne properties where Nora had resided. This grim process revealed the burial sites of two boys interred within the premises of the Davis Street residence. Subsequently, on September 8th, Sydney law enforcement apprehended Francis Knorr. Concurrently, Rudolf Knorr was taken into custody on suspicion of potential involvement in the murders, yet he vehemently denied any knowledge of the infant's burials. His detention, however, was short-lived as Melbourne authorities confirmed that they weren't currently investigating him. Rudolf Knorr's interactions with the police revealed that he had reunited with his wife in Brunswick around six weeks prior to their arrest after an 18-month period of separation. The situation took a turn when new evidence surfaced linking him to the infant murders on Davis Street. This prompted his re-arrest the following day. During her interrogation conducted by Detective Keaton, Frances maintained an upbeat demeanor despite the weight of the situation. Her emotional state did, however, show signs of being shaken upon learning about her husband's arrest. Throughout the questioning process, she vehemently insisted on her innocence regarding any acts of murder. Due to the perceived flight risk, the police closely monitored her, recognizing the potential for escape attempts. Just prior to her arrest, Frances Knorr had given birth to a daughter named Rita Daisy Knorr. This child was placed under the guardianship of Melbourne jail authorities and subsequently taken into the care of the Department of Neglected Children. Following a series of delays, Knorr's trials commenced in Melbourne on November 27, 1893, wherein she faced charges concerning the murder of the young girl. Simultaneously, she was also accused of participating in the murders of the two infants alongside her husband, Rudolph. Mr. Walsh, the Crown Prosecutor, contended that between April 8th and April 11th, Knorr had custody of the female infant who subsequently vanished. During this time, Knorr engaged in a pattern of frequent relocations, misleading others about her whereabouts. On April 11th, after moving to a residence on Moreland Road in Brunswick from Cardigan Street, Knorr sent a maid to borrow a spade from a neighbor and was observed making efforts to dig in the garden. The following Saturday, together with Rudolph, she moved yet again, this time to a house on Davis Street. Soon after, the infant's lifeless body was discovered by the next tenant of the Moreland Road property, concealed under a thin layer of earth. A letter penned by Knorr to a certain Ted Thompson was presented as evidence in court. In the letter, she claimed that the baby had succumbed to consumption and was buried by another individual. However, this letter was exposed as a fabrication. Taking the stand, Knorr admitted to burying the babies on Moreland Road, but argued that the children had died from natural causes. The prosecution, however, established that the infants had been strangled with tape, 
with one boy's neck compressed to less than half its usual size. Subsequently, Noor was convicted on December 15th. Justice Holroy pronounced a death sentence, witnessed by a sizable crowd. Throughout the judge's address, Noor wept uncontrollably, collapsing and requiring assistance to leave the courtroom for transport to Old Melbourne Jail, where she awaited execution. The charges related to the bodies discovered at the Davis Street location were dropped by the prosecution, leading to Rudolph Noor's discharge from the Supreme Court on December 16th. In a statement post-trial, he asserted that the baby seen alive with him had been adopted by families from other states and were not the same ones found buried at the Davis Street house. Despite limited support from newspapers of the era, public opinion on Noor's sentence was divided. Numerous letters to newspaper editors pleaded for leniency. Tragically, Thomas Jones, the state executioner, committed suicide nine days before the scheduled execution, driven by his wife's ultimatum to choose between her and executing Noor. Noor's demeanor within the confines of the condemned cell was described as that of a model inmate. Her time was occupied with hymn singing and fervent prayers. Shortly before her execution, she penned a written admission, a portion of which was revealed to the public on the day following her death. In this document, she conveyed, As I find myself on the brink of impending death, I am compelled to urge the release of this statement to the public in the earnest hope that my downfall may not only serve as that of a cautionary tale to others, but also discourage those who may be engaged in similar reprehensible actions. I now openly admit that I am indeed responsible for the charges commonly referred to as the first and second infant cases, as presented in the evidence. The moment of Nora's execution arrived at 10 a.m. on Monday, January 15, 1894. During her final hours, she engaged in hymn singing, finding solace in her faith. Her parting words were captured. Yes, the Lord is with me. I do not fear what men may do to me, for I have peace, perfect peace. As the trap door swung open, she descended a distance of seven feet six inches. The medical verdict rendered her death instantaneous. Her death mask is now on public display at the old Melbourne jail.